for example, in southern Europe. And these are areas where high population genetic diversity is maintained. And following deglaciation, organisms recolonize previously glaciated areas from the refugia, resulting in a pattern of low genetic diversity in recolonized areas and high diversity in refugial areas. And these refugia can be uh, altitudinal, as in the example of the Sierra Nevada, where high elevations were glaciated during the Pleistocene, or latitudinal, as in the example of northern and southern Europe. Within the Sierra Nevada, there has been a lot of phylogeographic work done, although a very limited amount of it has been done on the highest elevation alpine organisms, which occupy a unique environment. And there is sort of a continuum of phylogeographic <coughs> patterns, but two extremes of that are those exemplified by the genus Grilloblata, the ice crawlers, which live on ice, so they're really associated to the most extreme portions of the Sierra Nevada. And within Grilloblata, we see a pattern of uh, deep phylogeographic structure, which shows persistence in multiple refugia. At the other end of the spectrum are organisms which have recolonized the Sierra from a single refugium following deglaciation, such as Coleus veri, which shows signatures of uh, expansion from population <laughs> data and a near complete lack of variation throughout the Sierra. The group I'm going to be talking about today are the web-toed salamanders of the genus Hygromanes. These show a curious biogeographic pattern of only being found in California and Mediterranean Europe. The first species uh, found in California was Hygromanes platycephalus, the Mount Lyell salamander, which is known from high elevation in both the northern and the southern Sierra Nevada, and I'm going to use the same color scheme for the rest of the talk. And these organisms are uh, typically found in seep and spring habitat, uh, where there's granite on granite, so rocks on top of uh, rock surfaces associated with snow melt. And that was true until they were found in the desert in the 1980s. So on the east side of the Sierra Nevada, at much lower elevation, four or 5,000 feet lower, in the stream courses, you can find Hygromanes platycephalus just associated immediately with the stream, and then next to it, it's just desert. So they're found there and nowhere else in the Sierra Nevada, or in the Owens Valley. On the west side of the Sierra, also at low elevation, is what we thought was the sister species, Hydromanes brutus. Brutus is associated with limestone uh, talus habitat in uh, mossy oak buckeye forest. And it's confined to the Merced River drainage. The third species, which I won't talk about today, is Hydromanes shasti, the shasta salamander in Northern California. In some previous phylogeographic work that I did in my thesis, using both uh, mitochondrial and nuclear exons, I showed that there is a very deep phylogeographic break within the Sierra Nevada. It's a north-south break within Platycephalus, and it's on the order of what we often see between sister species of Lethodon and salamanders. Interestingly, Hydromanes brunus, which was always thought to be the sister species of Platycephalus, is nested within the northern lineage of Platycephalus, so those are the ones in green. And neither of the species are recipro reciprocally monophyletic for mitochondrial DNA with respect to each other. The Owens Valley populations, which were thought to represent an undescribed species of salamander because of the differences in habitat, and also some morphometric differences, are in fact interspersed throughout the clade of southern Sierra Nevada hydromanus polycephalus. The interesting thing about this is we see a really high level of phylogeographic structure within both lineages, and yet nearly all of the populations of polycephalus at high elevation were under glacial ice during the Pleistocene, which is shown in uh, Cyan. So this raises the question of how such phylogeographic structure was maintained if all of these populations likely had to colonize from one or multiple sources. And one obvious way to explain this pattern is that the Owens Valley populations at lower elevation were not covered by, by glacial ice, and so perhaps the Owens Valley was a refugium from which the High Sierra Nevada was recolonized. And although sometimes if you go to the Sierra Nevada, what you see is a sea of granite that looks like good habitat for Platycephalus. In fact, they're really patchily distributed across the landscape. So they only occur in this uh, seep associated habitat and only when there's enough snow melt to actually maintain the seeps. And although the high elevation habitat appears to be patchy, the habitat in the Owens Valley is much more so. So you can see these populations occur in what's essentially the middle of a desert valley. And you always find them immediately associated with streams and riparian habit habitat because next to it it's just arid sagebrush habitat where they would die within minutes. And uh, all of these stream courses are isolated from one another. 
along the length of the Owens Valley by this arid habitat. So it's unclear if these salamanders are moving between populations or if they have over historical time scales. And so the questions we wanted to answer are, was the Owens Valley in fact a glacial refugium that helped maintain this high phylogeographic structure seen within high elevation by the southwest? Uh, how much gene flow has occurred or is occurring within and between populations? And are there any latitudinal or elevational patterns of genetic diversity like those that have been seen in many phylogeographic studies around the world? In order to answer this question, uh, we first collected buccal swabs from nearly 260 individuals of Hygromanes platycephalus and Brunus from almost the entire geographic range. These salamanders are threatened, so we couldn't actually collect any of them. So no salamanders were harmed in the making of the study, uh, although that's actually not true, several of them were harmed. We also developed 10 tetranucleotide microsatellite loci and genotyped them for all individuals. We had a low amount of missing data, especially for the northern lineage. And we decided to analyze the data separately for the northern and the southern lineage, given that there's a kind of a time scale mismatch between how uh, microsatellites are useful and the level of divergence that we see between the two lineages. We first used structure to identify the number of genetic populations present within both lineages. Uh, we then made demographic models for uh, the southern lineage, which is what I'm going to focus on today, to test a couple different patterns of refugial isolation and distinguish them using uh, approximate Bayesian computation with ABC toolbox. We estimated a couple of uh, indices of geographic isolation and genetic diversity. And we use the program Maxent to estimate the current species distributional models using the standard 19 bioclimatic variables, and then projected these models onto climatic surfaces for the last glacial maximum and the mid Holocene warm period in order to see if there's a correspondence between uh, climatic niche changes over time and geographic structure. So just to jump to the results, within the northern Sierra Nevada, uh, the delta K method shows a number of populations of six. And interestingly, I've uh, put a box around the populations that correspond to Hydromanes brunus, the low elevation species. And um, although we do see some separation between brunus and Platycephalus, one high elevation population from the top of the iconic half dome in Yosemite always has some signature of gene flow with Hydromanes brunus. And so it appears that these populations have experienced gene flow over a really, really wide elevational and habitat gradient in the recent past, indicating that they may in fact not be reproductively isolated. And this is in contrast to the really oops, strong morphological and habitat divergence that we see them in. And in fact, they're uh, seasonally isolated too. Brutus comes out only in the winter and Phytocephalus only in the summer. Within the southern Sierra Nevada, uh, again, the delta K method shows a K of six, and we see much stronger population isolation in this uh, in this lineage. Basically, there's no signature of admixture between any of the populations, and the only sites that are grouped into the same genetic population are ones that were separated over only one to two kilometers. So, for example, within the 60 Lake Basin, which is a very small area. We didn't see any pattern of either altitudinal or latitudinal uh, declines in genetic diversity. We tested for patterns of both isolation by distance and isolation by environment using the MaxSound layers and the program circuitscape. Within the northern lineage, patterns of genetic uh, diversity and connectivity are well explained by a pattern of isolation by distance, but that's not true of isolation by distance or isolation by environment within the southern lineage. Using these groupings from structure for the southern lineage of Platycephalus, we uh, made four models that we used ABC to distinguish. The first model is a simple model of isolation without migration, so continuous fragmentation of populations. The second model uh, posits a refugium in the Owens Valley from which the high elevation Phytocephalus populations in the Sierra Nevada were recolonized following deglaciation. The third model is essentially the opposite of that with a refugium in the high Sierra Nevada from which Owens Valley populations were recolonized if possibly it was too hot for them, for example, in the mid Holocene warm period. And the first model, uh, or the fourth model, basically has the salamanders persisting with continuous migration between all of the populations that are geographic neighbors. 
After doing the ABC analysis, we also added uh, bottlenecks one by one to the preferred model to each population for which we had a sufficient sample size to see if there was any signature of population expansion. And to use a somewhat independent method, we also applied MSVAR, which is a fully Bayesian approach to look for bottlenecks in all of those populations. The ABC results really strongly favored the model of isolation with no migration. So it appears that these salamanders have essentially zero gene flow between any of the populations. We estimated the divergence times using a microsatellite mutation rate from Ambistoma, the mole salamanders, and we found that most of the divergences fall within the mid Holocene or more recently, although the initial divergences between populations stretch back into the Pleistocene. And we detected different bottlenecks using the two methods because one, uh, MSVAR is very sensitive to sample size, and so we uh, only used it for the largest populations. But we detected three bottlenecks only for the high Sierra Nevada populations and no bottlenecks for the lower elevation of Owens Valley populations. And all of these bottlenecks date to less than 2,500 years. The distributional models show us that the species distribution was likely much wider during the last glacial maximum. Although, again, we have to take into account that most of the populations were probably under ice. But climatically, most of the Owens Valley and additional mountain ranges, such as the White Mountains that are nearby, were probably suitable for the species. In the mid Holocene, we see that the range was much more fragmented, with the Owens Valley populations occurring in what was predicted to be unsuitable habitat. So, all of these results point to a very little gene flow occurring between the populations uh, that are separated by more than one to two kilometers. And the climatic niche models suggest that, in fact, warming may have been responsible for population fragmentation leading to the genetic structure that we see with the new species. And the divergence times that we estimate are consistent with this. So if they weren't in refugia, where were they? Well, uh, if we look at some sites where hydromanus body cephalos occurs, such as Mount Gardner, they look kind of like what you get if you Google moon attack. So in fact, I think that the salamanders may have just stuck it out on isolated bits of rock that were sticking out of the glacial ice. And the patterns we see for them are much more like the cryophilic organisms, like the ice crawlers, than they are like organisms that are associated with mountain meadows and forests. And so although we think of salamanders as being very fragile, it appears that despite some of their physiological uh, limitations, they just stuck it out in the middle of the ice. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody who funded me uh, and uh, my advisors from UC Berkeley, and all of you for waking up. So um, I think I have maybe one minute to take any questions.